What is going on guys, Gaston Ray here, and like I promised in my last video, here it is, my short-term review about the Noctilux 50mm f1.2 from Leica. Now, this one is going to be a short-term review because I've been shooting with the lens only for a couple of weeks, but I shot over 4,000 images. I got to shoot with this lens in my Leica M11P and also in the Leica M11 Monochrome, which is the camera that you see right here. So, in this video, I want to tell you about the things that I like about this lens and also some of the things that I don't like about this lens and why this lens has actually been glued to my Leica M11 monochrome. So, hentai, this one is gonna be a fun one. Welcome back, and before we continue, I would love to talk a little bit about the history of this lens. Now, back in late 1950s, journalists were looking for lenses that could allow them to capture their work in lower light situations. So, uh, lens companies such as Canon, Minolta, Nikon, they started working on prototypes of 50-ish fast lenses. And the reason why I mention 50 ish is because the earlier prototypes were about 55 millimeters, 52 millimeters, 58 millimeters. And Leica came up with this version of this particular lens back in 1966. Now, when this version came out, only um, less than 1,800 units were created from this lens, from the original version, because the process that entailed to create the aspherical elements that we're gonna find in the front and in the back were done 100% handmade. Only one person at Leica could actually operate the only machine they have to craft this element. For that reason alone, I think that's one of the main reasons why this lens was limited only to 1800 units. And now if you wanna get one of those original copies, you gotta expect to pay a pretty penny. Take a look at this, you know, some lens is going over $50,000. Of course, the version that I have in front of me is the reissue, and this version is gonna run you, if you um, wanna get it brand new, at around $8,000. So let's talk a little bit about the design of this lens. And the first thing is gonna be the build. You know, the build of this lens is actually really good. It feels really solid in the hand. Now, one of the reasons why I went with this version, the F1.2 rather than F1 or 0.95, is because this version is pretty manageable. You know, it is a size that is not much larger than the Somilux 50 millimeter F1.4 version two. And also the way it's right on my limit. It weighs at around 400 grams, 405 to be exact. And these days, you know, I, I don't like to carry heavy lenses. One of the reasons why I gravitate towards the M system is because, you know, lenses can actually be fast and also small in size. Now, the F1 version and 0.95, they are more expensive. They are larger and heavier. So pretty much everything that I'm trying to avoid in a lens. All right, so let's talk about the aperture of this lens. And the first thing that I would like to discuss is the aperture ring. Because the first thing that I noticed when shooting with this lens is that from f1.2 to f2, the aperture actually slips very, very easily. And a lot of the times, you know, I find myself bumping the aperture. Now from f2 to f16, I don't have that problem because it's a lot clickier. So I don't know if it's something that has to do with the fact that I got this lens pre-owned and it has some signs of use. But if you own this lens brand new, let me know if you have these problems in the comment down below. Now, when it comes to the aperture system of this lens, this lens is gonna feature a 16 blade aperture system. Now, this is gonna be great because it's going to allow the lens to render a very smooth bokeh. And I'm talking about the individual shape of the bokeh. Now, this lens is gonna render more of that cut eye type of shape than bokeh balls, and it is something that you have to be very aware of it because I know that there are a lot of people that don't like when the bouquet looks like lemons or almonds, and this is gonna happen fairly easy. You're gonna have to actually shoot to get round bouquet right in the center, you know, your bouquet ball is gonna have to be right in the center because as you start moving towards the edges, that kata shape is gonna be there. Now, take a look at this image right here, and I wanna show you uh, the rendition from the areas in focus towards the areas of out of focus, and I really like this look that we can produce with this lens when shot open wide. Whether it is color or black and white, I consider this look, you know, pretty magical. Now, one of the things that you're gonna have to be mindful as well, this lens is gonna have, once again, the vintage swirly uh, bokeh effect, specifically in foliage. You know, take a look at this image right here. As you see, we have a lot of foliage in the background, and you can see that swirly, you know, so bubble type of effect, which I actually love. One of the reasons why, you know, I decided to spend that kind of money for a lens like this one. And again, you know, all these uh, flaws or characters that I'm mentioning right now are going to be the reasons why you may wanna pick up this lens. You know, I know that if we're talking about sterile images, those are the things that you would try to refrain from. 
but it is something that you have to be aware of because this lens is gonna have lots of that specifically when shot open wide. Now, speaking about character, we gotta talk about vignetting because this lens is gonna have a heavy amount of vignetting, specifically at f1.2. Take a look at this image right here. At f1.2, you are gonna have vignetting almost in the entire image from the edges towards the center of the image. And of course, as we start stopping down our aperture, that vignetting is gonna start fading away. Now, at about f5.6, you know, the vignetting is almost gone. So, you know, you are gonna have a fair amount of vignetting. And a lot of the times, even shot open wide, take a look at this correction here in Lightroom. It's really hard to get rid of it with a profile correction in Lightroom. So you are gonna have to embrace that vignetting when shooting open wide. All right, so what about flaring, chromatic aberrations, spherical aberrations? And the good news or bad news is that this lens is going to have a lot of that stuff. So flaring, this lens, yes, it is going to flare when shooting in direct light, but it's not the worst performer that I've seen in a vintage lens. Now, the good thing is that this lens, I believe it always has been sold with lenses. So, you know, if that bothers you, you can put that in your lens. Now, when it comes to chromatic aberration, this lens is gonna have also heavy chromatic aberrations in areas of high contrast, like for example, this image right here that pretty much has everything. Now you can see the magenta hue, you know, very prominent there, and it's going to remain from the f1.2 almost to the f4. Now the other feature or character of this lens is going to be the spherical distortion or spherical aberrations that you are gonna have. This lens is going to have, you know, that separation of color as you go towards the edges. Like you can see in this image, you can see that greenish or magenta hue. That's because the lens cannot focus all the colors in one single point. Now, if I have to describe with a couple of words the look of this lens, I would say that this lens has a pretty magical, soft, dreamy, and heavy vintage character. So the Noctilux 50 millimeter f1.2, when shot at f1.2 up to the f4, is gonna display that softer look. You're gonna see a lot of glow, a lot of hazing in the image. Very, you know, typical of this type of vintage lenses. Now, when you stop down to f5.6, and now, like I mentioned before, the lens is going to be a little bit sharper. It's never gonna be as sharp as a 50 millimeter Sumicrom, for example, but it is going to get sharper. Another thing that you need to know is that this lens is gonna have rather a yellowish cast you know, to the color rendition of your images. And I think that you can take advantage of this look, specifically when shooting around sunsets. For example, like in this image, you know, the, the mood, the ambience that this lens can create in those scenarios is pretty mystical. Now, the next thing that I would like to talk about is the minimum focusing distance, because even though this is a reissue lens, we still have the one meter minimum focusing distance. Now, for a lot of photographers, this may be a problem. It wasn't a problem for me because I know what I was getting into, but a lot of the times, you know, watching it with this lens, I wish I had a little bit closer focusing distance, and I think that if like I would have made this lens with a 0.7, that would have been good enough, at least for myself, just to get those images that I couldn't get with this lens. But once again, you know, I know the strength of this lens and limitations, so, when it comes to minimal focusing distance, it's not so much of a problem for me, but if this one is gonna be the only one lens you're gonna be picking up, that may be something that you wanna reconsider. All right, so let's talk about some of the negatives about this lens, and I wouldn't call them negative, but at least things that I wish this lens did a little bit better. And the first one is gonna be the rather slower focusing performance. Yes, this focusing ring features a scallop design, not a focusing ring with a tab. And because of that, it's gonna take you some time to go from infinity to minimum focusing distance. As you see, you know, it'll take a couple of pinching of the lens. And it did cost me a couple of times to miss a few shots. The second thing is that because you don't have a tab, it's a lot harder to index the position of your focusing ring. So I find myself having to kind of like pinch the lens in either direction just to figure it out, the position of the ring or the focus, and then acquire focus with it. And last but not least, this lens actually has rather a longer focusing throw. It's about 180 degrees from minimal focusing distance to infinity. So like I mentioned before, as you see, it's going to take quite some pinching just to get from one end to the other. So with tabs, you know that operation is much faster. You just put your finger under and you swivel and you're done with it. But with the pinching, it could take a little bit longer now, the next thing that I wanna mention as a negative or something that I wish like I could have maybe improved would have been the um, minimal focusing distance of one meter. 
One meter is kind of long, you know, and this lens being super fast, 50 millimeters, you know, it makes you want to come close to thing just to get that nice background separation. But I found myself a lot of the times, you know, having to step back just to allow the camera to acquire focus. And I think that if this lens would have had at least a 0.7 meter, it would have been a much more versatile lens. And for this reason alone, you know, I wouldn't call this negatives, but at least things that you have to be mindful before picking up one of these lenses. So who is this lens for and would I recommend this lens? And the answer is going to be very simple. If you already owned a much more correct lens, this lens may be for you, specifically if you're looking for a lens with that right out of the gate vintage look. This lens, like I mentioned before, is gonna have a lot of that stuff. And that's the main reason why I mentioned that this shouldn't be anyone's first lens. Well, number one, this lens is gonna run you out around $8,000, you know, if you buy a brand new, at about $5,000, $6,000 if you buy used. So it's a pretty expensive, you know, penny to spend for a lens that you may not use that often. And you have to be aware of the look of this lens because I have a friend that owns the lens, bought it brand new, and he's not too happy because he was expecting something much more clinical. Again, it is a vintage lens. Now, if you're looking for a happy median lens, something much more affordable, there are gonna be options from Canon, you know, vintage Canon glass, or for example, this Nocton 50 millimeters F1.2 that I also own, which is a lens that is gonna give you at F1.2, you know, that dreamy look, but as you stop down, this lens is going to be much more corrected. Also, this lens is gonna be sharper than the uh, Noctilux 50 millimeters F1.2 when shot open wide. And again, you know, $750 that I bought to use on eBay versus $5,200, there is a big difference. And when it comes to size, basically they are almost the same. Maybe the Voilander is a little bit shorter, but it's a little bit thicker in diameter. All right, this is gonna be it for today, guys. This is my quick overview of the 50 millimeters Noctilux F1.2 from Leica. What a beautiful lens, guys. And if you have some experience with this lens or the other version, the F1 0.95, let me know in the comments down below. And as always, if you had enjoyed this video, give it a like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so. Until then, I'll see you in the next one.